Now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, General McConville. We're honored this morning to welcome him because he's one of our own. He's the 36th uh, U.S. Army Vice Chief of Staff and a keynote speaker. He's no stranger to the Army aviation community, being a master Army aviator with an outstanding career in aviation in both peace and war. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Major, uh, General Jim McConville. Thank you. Thank you. Well, well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you, Steve, for that wonderful introduction. You know, I, I, I can't tell you how pleased I am to be here today. It's great to be outside the Pentagon during daylight. And second, to be in the company of so many uh, great aviators and support, supporters of aviation that I've served with. Many of my old bosses here, General Cody, General Brown, General Daly, General Thurman, General Slosher, um, and they're probably all surprised, just like Steve, for me to be standing up here as the Vice Chief of Staff of the Army. But now is a great time to be in the Army. It's a great time to be in Army aviation because we're in the, at the cusp of making some truly significant developments in the Army as far as modernization and in, 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 in aviation, and I'm very, very proud to be part of that. And although there'll be many technological changes in the future, one thing that will not change in the Army is the role of Army aviation, and that role is to support the troops on the ground. And that is something we should never forget. It was true for the first Aero Squadron Flying Reconnaissance Missions on the U.S. border in Mexico in 1915, and it remains true today in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Korea, wherever our great aviators are flying. However, what it means to support the troops on the ground is in changing and evolving as the world changes around us. You know, we can no longer assume that our post-Cold War dominance will be the same as the world's only remaining superpower. While collective military attention was focused on 16 plus years of counterinsurgency operations, our adversaries have been studying us. They've made intellectual, organizational, and material investments designed to give them an advantage in future wars. Their efforts combined with the impacts of our ongoing counterinsurgency operations constrained budgets and rapidly evolving technologies have produced a new era of great power competition. Long-term strategic competition with China and Russia formed the foundation of our recently produced national defense strategy. That strategy, that strategic competition, coupled with the enduring threats from places like North Korea and Iran, as well as the persistent dangers that we face from violent extremist organizations mean the world has changed. Those changes don't necessarily mean that we're going to fight. They don't necessarily mean that we're going to war. But what they do mean is that we're going to compete, we're going to deter and, and win in a very different way than what we've gotten to used to. These developments require that we adapt our industrial age institutions and processes and leverage new concepts and technologies for advantage in an ever-changing environment. For the past 16 years, we've been pretty much uncontested except on land. But in the future, we anticipate and we expect we will be contested in the air, on the land, at sea, in cyber, and in space. We will fight in an anti-access aerial denial, A2AD environment, where we not enjoy the sea and air superiority that we've long taken for granted. Think about this. The last time an American soldier was killed by enemy air was April 15, 1953. That's a remarkable achievement, but one that we can no longer assume that we'll enjoy in future warfare. The imperative of this new contested domain warfare is driving Army modernization. To regain the overmatch and continuously adapt our force, 
to retain decisive advantage, we require a unified, highly responsive, efficient modernization enterprise, a clear modernization strategy, and aggressive implementation. This enterprise must integrate cutting-edge technologies with new war-fighting concepts to, to deliver overmatching capabilities at scale with continuous upgrades. Last October, our Chief of Staff of the Army, General Mark Milley, announced six modernization priorities. Long-range precision fires. When was the last time long-range precision fires was the number one priority for the United States Army? Next generation combat vehicle. You don't deter near-peer adversaries with MRAPs. You do it with armor, you do it with attack helicopters, and you do it with long-range artillery. Number three, future vertical lift. Number four, the Army network. Number five, air and missile defense. And air and missile defense going to the maneuver level for short-range air defense. And finally, we want the most lethal soldiers on the battlefield. We invested an enormous amount of organization, organizational and intellectual energy over the last six months to ensure we have the entire Army organization, the leadership, the research and development, the requirements, and the acquisition communities all align behind these six modernization priorities. So if you're looking for where the resources are going and you're in industry, this is where they're going and we are aligning all our processes to make that happen. These six modernization priorities drove the creation of cross-functional teams. And General Wally Rugen is leading the cross-functional team for future vertical lift. And eventually these will become aligned under the Army Futures Command that we are standing up this summer. The Army Futures Command will be fundamentally different from any other organization in the United States Army because its focus will be the future in development of concepts and materials that we need to get there. It will address intellectual and material transformation by changing not just the processes and organizations, but also the knowledge, skills, and attributes and behavior of the people within them. How we fight, how we organize the fight, and the systems and technologies which we will fight with are inextricably interrelated, and there must be unity of command across the development of all future concepts, requirements, and material solutions. Modernization at the pace of 21st technological changes requires constant interaction between the exploration of warfighting concepts and technology. And at the same time, we must not produce better tools if what we need are different tools. It's not about faster horses, but new ways of maneuvering on the battlefield. The Army cannot afford to squander its finite resources. And though we have a good budget, we can't always assume that's the way it's going to be in the future and, and risk our institutional credibility on massive programs that overpromise, underdeliver, and then die of their own fiscal weight. We must not make single bets on capabilities with unappreciated risk. The culture we must encourage means failing early and cheap, but not failing always, and learning fast in pursuit of developing real solutions to real problems. So what does all, all this mean for Army Aviation? In a future anti-access, denial environment, Army Aviation will still need to provide support to the troops on the ground. That's what they exist for. We look to the Army Aviation to create windows of dominance within the anti-access aerial denial environment and then work to exploit those windows for the joint force. Understanding that future, we recognize that while aviation platforms we have are the best in the world, they will not be sufficient for a future where we're contested in every domain. When we start running out of letters for incremental improvement, it's time for new rotorcraft. I know many of you want to hear about future vertical lifts. Future vertical lift will not change our essential missions in Army aviation. The Army aviation will still need to find the enemy, we we'll still need to kill the enemy, and we'll still need to assault and move troops in cargo around the battlefield to gain advantage. So what will our next, gener what will our next rotorcraft be? Fundamentally, it starts at the objection, at the objective. 
with actions on the objective. We must be able to deliver lethal files, fires, or combat troops to where they are needed. We must be able to do it faster, at greater range, with more agility, longer endurance, and greater survivability than we have today, and we must do it at cost. Where the person in, in, in the loop becomes an essential question that we must answer as we move in the future of contested warfare. We want people to think outside the box. We want aviators, like some of the aviators on this slide, and I do want to congratulate uh, CW5 Paul Price. Uh, these are all titans of aviation that I had the, the honor of serving with, and these are the type of people that we need uh, as we go into the future. Our industrial age personnel systems will not get us there. So as we modernize the Army, we're also modernizing our personnel systems. We are moving from an industrial age personnel system to a 21st century talent management system. We presently have three personnel systems for the entire Army. One for the active, one for the guard, and one for the reserve. That's no way to run the Army, and we're going to change that in the future because the criticality of the total force is something that we need to have. Now, as we move in the future, we'll certainly look at unmanned and autonomous aircraft, but it has to be a balanced approach. Our future air aircraft will be optionally manned and will conduct man-unmanned teaming-type operations. We also see a future, we'll think about this, we'll have unmanned, unmanned operations as we go in, in the, into the future. And we believe there's no reason to put a pilot at the breach or maybe at the point as we go into an integrated air defense system because, but there'll always, always be a, a person in the loop. So as we move to this new system, this new talent, talent management system, we move from an industrial age system that will be able to manage the individual talents of everyone in the Army. The way we do it today, we basically manage by two vari variables. You're a sergeant of engineers. You're a captain of infantry. As we move in the future, we'll see a system that manages our soldiers, non-commissioned officers, and leaders by maybe 25 variables. We'll know what their talents are, their knowledge, skills, and attributes. We know what languages speak. We'll know what countries they've been to. We'll know what their cognitive and non-cognitive uh, skill sets are. We'll have them credentialed in areas where we can make maximum advantage of their talents. We will no longer mask their talents, especially in the Guard and Reserve, by the two variables that are their grade and MOS. And we think as we move in the future, this is going to be absolutely essential uh, to be able to conduct the operations as we go forward to ensure we have the most qualified people in the right positions at the right time to make a difference. So in closing, we see, a we see exciting times ahead for the Army in aviation. The right people in the right jobs paired with the right technology and an intellectual and material innovation enterprise designed to produce results which will ensure our continuous dominance as the greatest army in the world. The future is bright and there's a light at the end of the tunnel and it's not a train. Thank you for all your time today. We remain Army strong.